Hello there, you're watching the Press Preview, our first look at what's on the newspaper front pages as they come in. Over the next half an hour, we're going to be seeing what's making the headlines with the Times columnist Matthew Syed and the writer and columnist Christina Patterson. So very good evening to both of you. So let's take a look then at what's on the front pages of those papers. And The Observer is leading with our top story, Donald Trump's tweets as he defends his mental health. There are rumours of a cabinet reshuffle on Monday, as Justine Greening is reported in the Sunday Telegraph to be fighting for her cabinet position. Theresa May has voiced her distaste for a string of sexist tweets, tweets sent by Toby Young on the front of the Mail on Sunday. An investigation by the Sunday Times reports that Google is making millions by charging referral agents who advertise free advice helplines. The Daily Star on Sunday as has sex offender John Warboys believing that he has been forgiven by God. And the Sunday Express says the PM has ordered a review into the release of John Warboys after nine years in prison. So let's talk through those front pages and some of the stories that uh, Matthew Syed and Christina Patterson have spotted inside as well. Uh, we're going to actually t turn to one of the front pages and it's the uh, Donald Trump story today. Um, there's the front of the Observer quoting his tweet uh, earlier on today saying, I'm a very stable genius. <laughs> as you do, as you do when, uh, when you're trying to uh, <laughs> show your general mental stability. Uh, this book, um, I am dying to read it, although I actually feel like I've read it because I've read so many extracts in the papers this week and actually most of the papers have the same extracts. I suspect they're kind of copying them from each other. And they are absolutely gripping. And um, I have to say, I think, I think they do have the ring of truth. Uh, Michael Wolff is an award-winning political writer. He's done 200 interviews for this book. He, um, he gained uh, incredible access to the White House and Trump's support as, as staff and aides, and indeed Trump, due, it seems, uh, to a misunderstanding because Donald Trump didn't seem to understand what he was doing. Um, well, he says he wasn't interviewed personally, wasn't he? And he, he says that it's, it's fiction. And, fiction. And, well, it, well, yeah. well he, he, I mean, we all know that Trump instantly says everything is fake news, but there are 200 tapes of those uh, interviews, which presumably is why his publishers are so confident about releasing it in spite of uh, Trump getting endless lawyers involved. But, um, I mean, I feel weirdly cheered up by it because my sense about Trump from the beginning has been... A, that he is really, really, really not very bright. We know, he, we already knew he didn't read. Um, the book says he not only doesn't read, he doesn't even skim. I mean, words just don't feature apart from what he spouts forth um, completely inconsistently all the time. He doesn't listen, apparently. He literally just likes speaking. Contradicts himself all the time, as we knew. But I feel um, slightly cheered up that it, it, there is, you know, a lot of corroborating evidence now that my instincts and a lot of people's instincts seem to be accurate and people talked about armchair psychiatrists diagnosing him and how that was such an awful thing to do well actually it seems from this book that all the people who work with him think he's pretty much a nutcase and totally unfit to be president of the united <coughs> states and just not up to the task and dangerous and i think the fact when this is out one one uh, very wealthy um uh, uh, I think uh, Senator has bought um, copies for the for every member of Congress. It might be the other way around. I can't remember the House. I can't remember. I think it's Congress, and I do think this will this will open the eyes of the world to what they're dealing with in a way that really can't be denied. Okay. The Emperor has no clothes. Uh, and uh, Matthew, you shook your head <laughs> at various <laughs> points there. Yeah. Uh, what, what do you really think? Um, <laughs> I, I, look, I, I dislike his politics. Um, what very politics? Much, he doesn't very have any. much his populism, his anti-immigration rhetoric. I think he's a bully. I definitely think he's volatile. Um, the idea that he's unintelligent, you said a bit dim, I think, in, in, in your Well, Michael uh, Wolf says, everybody around him says he's thick as two short planks. That is nonsense. You, you just do not win the primaries and you do not win the presidency if you are stupid. And I think that um, his critics are underestimating him again, and I think that's very dangerous. Um, I think the only really stupid thing that Trump has done in this context is talk and tweet about this book because it has given it the oxygen of publicity. It's already number one without having, um, before it even came out. I think that was a strategic error by him. I don't like him at all, 
but I think he has a fierce practical intelligence and you don't win the presidency without that. And yet, when he does tweet and he says, I'm a very stable <laughs> genius, and what else did he, did he say? He says, I'm like very smart as well. He, he's essentially talking to his supporters, isn't of he? Course. Then they want to hear yeah. what he has to say and they will trust and believe him and they won't mm -hmm. trust journalists. Oh, I so agree with that. Does he not need to, to put out his defense because his well, uh, I, base I, I, is waiting for it? I think you're absolutely right. His media manipulation has a touch of, of genius about it. Tweeting in the early hours of the morning, he dominates the news coverage. You know, he won the presidency against his own party. Romney came out against him, McCain came out against him, the media was against him. He still won. That's an extraordinary achievement. And he didn't even want to win, according to the book, which I believe. That, I, I mean, believe. That's one of the things that makes me think this, this book is way... I mean, I do think that Trump is very volatile. I think that he is quite childish in the way he responds with insults to people who challenge his opinion, his lack of rationality in certain respects. But I do think he's got a, a, a real deep cunning, and I think that it's very dangerous. Instead of attacking him on policy, which I think he's very vulnerable to, you attack him for being stupid. Well, I think most people can see that he is not stupid. And no, again, I, him, no, I, 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 I know, very often, as, as you know, we very often agree, Matthew, but I think you are absolutely categorically wrong on this. I really, really do. And I think that I, I'd be really interested to see when you, if you read the book to see whether you still hold that view, because I, I have felt for a long time that he, I mean, you know, he's, he talks about one state solution, two state solution, what difference does it make? He doesn't understand policy. He, he didn't know anything about policy when he went into the White House. He hasn't studied politics, he hasn't read, he hasn't even followed the news. The, I, I think this idea that there is some kind of fantastic strategic brain behind all of this is okay. completely misplaced. Can I just make one final yeah. point? During the primaries, he was up against a very wide array of very talented Republican politicians, Bush and uh, the whole gamut of the most able right-wing politicians in America, the, the greatest one of the great democracies of the world. You can't get through those debates with some understanding of the minutiae of policy. Go and re-watch them and then watch the presidential debates against Clinton. Watch his interview. Watch the whole of the Camp David press conference. He was asked about a whole range of it. I watched it all, all 20 minutes. He does have a grasp of policy. You can't get through it without... It's, it's, t it's all too easy to caricature the people we disagree with. It happened with Ronald Reagan. You know, people said he was dumb, he was stupid, he was mocked on not the nine o'clock news. He was not an unintelligent man. I disagreed with his politics. I don't think Ronald Reagan was unintelligent, but I do think Donald Trump is. But he, I do think he's a very good communicator. I do think that. Trump. I think that's what he won. Yeah, I think he and won just because he connected with the middle America. Mm -hmm. Very quick nod to the double page spread that you picked out there in the Mail on Sunday, uh, suggesting that the royals have somehow got in, in, uh, caught up in this. Yeah. Well, this is, um, this is worrying, actually, because um, Michael Wolff argues, uh, convincingly to me and not to you, Matthew, <laughs> that uh, because his ego, because, that Trump's ego dictates absolutely everything he does, and um, because, unfortunately, Theresa May rushed to promise uh, a royal visit, you know, kind of two minutes after he became president, it's now a point of pride and ego of him that he has his royal visit, and... Um, and uh, My Michael Wolf claims that if he doesn't get his royal visit and if he doesn't get invited to the royal wedding, that he won't give us the trade deal that we will probably need post-Brexit. And that is very worrying. And I, I feel, I don't think, I'm sure that uh, Harry and Prince Harry and Meghan Markle, the last thing they want in the world is to have Trump at their wedding. They do want the Obamas because they are genuinely very good <coughs> friends. Yeah. And um, I think you should be able to have who you like at your own wedding. However, if it really is going to do damage to us, and it, and it clearly could do if we don't get a trade deal with the US, that is worrying. I, I think that that part of the book is plausible. I think he does react very negatively to any sort of personal slight or criticism. He's quite hot-headed in that respect. The one I wanted to pick up that, that seems to be utterly ridiculous, I don't think I mentioned it before, is the idea he wanted to lose the presidential election. I mean, honestly, 
This guy went through that entire campaign. He, I think, no, he wanted to. He wanted money. to. He, no, I think he, didn't, he, was, he didn't put money. Well, he loaned, but he he he, he refused he, to put his own money in. He loaned ten million, didn't he? He but loaned. He he. Um, I think he was surprised that he won, along with most political commentators. But he clearly wanted to win no, the presidency. No, I don't think he did. <laughs> I mean, that, that, that does agree with you, Matthew. <laughs> really not. I think he looked miserable. They both looked absolutely miserable at the inauguration. Okay, I'm going to move us uh, close to home <laughs> and to politics um, uh, within the Westminster circle. Uh, the Sun Sunday Telegraph there on its front page is, is talking about the imminent cabinet reshuffle. The Sunday Times as well, political yeah. editor, is saying it's going to happen on Monday. Uh, their suggestion is that Justin Greening could be vulnerable in any switch around. It's brutal, isn't it, politics? Mm, you really know, you're brutal. about to get sacked mm. and it's on the front Awful, pages. Yeah. Um, I must say, it's one of the few occasions in the build-up to a reshuffle where I feel a deep sympathy to mm. people who go into frontline politics. Because most people... lots of sympathy for them a lot of the time, I must say. I think it's a, I think it's a tough, tough job. Sorry to interrupt. It's often met with glee, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, they got sacked. Yes, yeah. how fantastic. Um, so Greening looks like she may well be in line for the axe. And um, is the suggestion uh, over grammar schools, disagreement over grammar schools? I think is just she hasn't performed well enough in and Theresa May wants to um, get on the front foot with education and to be polling ahead of Labour. She sees this as a key uh, political issue. Um, there was a story in one of the other papers, they wanted to bring in lots more um, women, uh, people from ethnic minorities. I think that's a positive thing, as long as they're good enough to do the job. Um, there's also a, uh, t towards the end of this, that um, uh, Don Dominic Rabb may come in as the immigration minister, which would be interesting. Jeremy Hunt is considered to be a safe pair of hands. He is being uh, mooted as the replacement for Damien Green as the de facto deputy prime minister. That may be delayed because of the crisis in the NHS. Mm. So interesting stuff. And will this give uh, Theresa May somehow a, a, a fresh New Year bounce, do you think? I mean, she was obviously doing better before Christmas than some people mm. had thought because she managed to get that breakthrough yeah. in those early stages of Brexit negotiations. And will this kind of somehow give her a little bit more power? Who knows? I think the word bounce doesn't seem well, you know, <laughs> the word bounce. Matthew wrote a book called Bounce. I don't <laughs> oh, think, that's thank nice you, thank you very much. <laughs> I don't think the word bounce is really like, it seems terribly <laughs> relevant to Theresa May or her cabinet. But, um, Look, she's, uh, she's got to do something, uh, particularly uh, that there are reports in the last few days that uh, Tory party membership has dropped to maybe as low as 70,000. 70,000, really? that is nothing. So clearly, uh, she does need to do something to uh, bring more appeal. And I think probably having a younger and uh, more representative cabinet would help. But it is all about the talent and unfortunately she's keeping it apparently keeping Boris Johnson as foreign secretary which seems to me a terrible mistake but there okay. you go. Okay we, we're going to leave it there we are going to talk about uh, lots after the break including I think we're focusing on this story on the front of the Sunday Times. Um, is it game set and the end of the road? It's not normally what you say is it? Isn't it match? Match. <laughs> <laughs> For the Wimbledon champion Andy Murray we're talking about that in a moment. Welcome back. You're watching the press preview. With me tonight, the Times columnist Matthew Syed and the writer and columnist Christina Patterson. And we're going to head to the front page of the Mail on Sunday next because uh, their story focuses on uh, Theresa May, who they suggest is being uh, very critical of the tweets sent by uh, Toby Young, who's been appointed to the university regulator. Is that how you put it? It's a difficult one, this. I, I felt very torn by it. When I saw him being targeted um, and a huge number of uh, signatories to a petition calling for him to be sacked as a member of this university watchdog, he's one of 15, I think, on the board, I felt a bit sympathetic that he had sent out some tweets uh, more than five years ago that were supposed to be funny. Um, and at the time, he wasn't, as I understand it, seeking public office. But having looked at the content of those mm -hmm. tweets, the um, graphic nature of them, the one that's come to light in the mail on Sunday, which is, I don't even want to repeat mm, what it said. Thank um, you. I uh, think that he probably isn't suitable and that our public pronouncements must have consequences. If one could always say, well, I didn't mean it at the time I said it. If he, if he was a teenager, yes. But to have done it as, as a, as a grown-up, as an adult, in the public eye, understanding the way the media works, and now to seek 
public office, I, I think, on balance, I think he shouldn't be allowed he, to do it. I think he it. said he's regretted some of them. Yeah. He says some are deliberately being misinterpreted. But he also tries to focus on the, the, what he says would be ironic, the fact that you know he, people who want freedom, freedom of speech and, and free speech at universities are being critical of him, perhaps saying a few un-PC things on Twitter. Well, they're not just un-PC. Um, like you, Matthew, I, I was initially uh, not sure before before all the Twitter stuff emerged I, there were, I saw various tweets from very qualified academics in high dudgeon that um, yeah, that someone yeah. less qualified should have got that role and I thought it's not about your academic qualifications it's about what you can bring to the role but government public appointments are meant to be about your character and your integrity and you're meant to stick to something they call the Nolan principles which are various values they list of um, qualities and they are clearly I'm afraid not demonstrated by uh, all of this stuff that um, that's on Twitter and in a lot of Toby Young's past journalism he's talked about being a porn addict and all kinds of things and although no one misdemeanor um, or well, vice necessarily them. disqualifies you from public life no. I think that the I think that what has the picture has built up of past journalism yeah. and uh, content on social media and actually just behavior in in I mean what you do in private I guess is up to you but how you conduct yourself in uh, TV studios and in public places that is not a private matter yeah. and I'm afraid I don't think he he has the integrity for the role okay and uh, he has I think, uh, on, uh, just, just one thing I think it's really important that we do have people serving on boards of this kind who are from outside the establishment, oh, I agree outside with that. The, yes. the typical uh, unionised um, uh, background. Because I think diversity in boards, in committees, is, I mean, it's very well established in the psychological literature. They make better decisions. OK, let's move on to the front page of the Sunday Times. We said we'd talk about Andy Murray, and, and there he is um, in this article here. Uh, they're posing the question. Is this the end of his tennis career? Because he's having terrible problems with his, his hip, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Mm. Oh, well, I think it's terribly great. sad. Uh, uh, mm. You know, what a great athlete, great ambassador for British sport. Came from a tiny place in Scotland, Dunblane, coached by his mother, another hero. Um, he's had an extraordinary run. For a long time, he lost in Grand Slam finals, and people said he didn't have it mentally to take that final step. He did it. I think he's been embraced by the British public. It took a long time mm. for that to happen. He's won the BBC Sports Personality of the Year a number of times now. Uh, I think it would be very, very sad if he were to be um, brought down by, by injury. But I've got to say, a lot of these top tennis players have such very rigorous schedules and it's so punishing tennis over five sets. Mm. You know, it may well be that we've seen mm. the end of, at least of him as a Grand Slam contender. Mm. I'd be very sad to see. And I do feel, I mean, you know, obviously as a former Olympian and table tennis number one, <laughs> you know all about uh, moving on to other things incredibly successfully in your case, but, but a lot of sports people find it very difficult to yes, make the transition true. and they have very short careers and actually you know we can moan about um, sort of preening footballers earning an absolute fo fo fortune and I do think a lot of them are paid ludicrous amounts of money but it still isn't easy I mean people like David Beckham well I say people like David Beckham actually he's the only one who's made an absolutely triumphant success out of it in financial terms if mm. nothing else and for many sports people you've been doing one thing yeah. with laser like focus yeah. all your life and true. suddenly you've got this whole new world to negotiate and you're I'm afraid generally speaking respect for you does dwindle the, the further you away are the, the further you away yeah. the further you are from your achievements I'm yeah. now <laughs> completely and I'm really going to be an ex-commentator ex any minute now. Well, well, you won't be. We will have you back at 11.30. In fact, you must come back at 11.30, but we are going to leave it there. Christina and Matthew, for the moment, thanks very much indeed.